Well, good morning, everybody. It's, it's Independence Day weekend, and we're glad that you took some time to celebrate worship and Holy Communion with us. And we will be having communion t t today, and if you had, didn't get the word or forgot, uh, sometime maybe after the sermon, pause your tape so you can go and get whatever elements you happen to have around the house. And because God is involved, whatever elements you can find, will be just swell. We went to a church last week, outdoor worship, and uh, they were doing communion and we didn't take anything, but we did have a bottle of water, so we figured that would do well enough. Let's be now in a spirit of worship. Let all the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for you, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. Let's pray. Come, sovereign God, and rule the world. All the nations are yours. Let laws be fair. Let justice be impartial. Let the rights of the poor and of children be defended. Help us to turn away from racism and discrimination. Rescue the innocent from the power of those who do evil. Let corruption be purged. Let righteousness prevail. Come, sovereign God, and rule the world. All the nations are yours. Our first scripture reading today will be from the book of Genesis. We're finishing up with the story of... Oh, you didn't do that? No, it's Genesis first. Okay. <laughs> I'll sit down. Genesis first. It's just like real worship, isn't it? It is. And we could finish the story of Abraham, and we're moving into the story of Isaac, and maybe even more so than Isaac, the story of Rebekah. So he said, I am Abraham's servant, and as the Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy, he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from among the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. And I came to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you only make successful the way I am going, I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. And before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew, and I said to her, Please let me drink. And she quickly let her jar down from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will also water your camels. And so I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. And then I bowed my head and worshiped God the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. And now if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the left hand or the right. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse, along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. 
Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahoy Roy and was settled in the Negev. And Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly away from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after her mother's death, his mother's death. It's just a lovely story, I think. Let's be in a spirit of prayer now, and let's take some moments of silent prayer for our family, our friends who may be in need of prayer for whatever reason, for our community and for our nation. Especially as we think about this weekend, what freedom means, perhaps we can think about what it might mean for the future. Let's take a few moments of silence. <clears throat> Creator God, who rules over all peoples and nations and works in and through the world's history, we come to you today with prayers for all people, for the church, and on this weekend for this nation and all its people. As we look at back and recall the beginnings of our independence, we know that we need your help and we need your mercy. This country was founded on an idea that all were created equal and that government should be of the people, for the people, and by the people and also on a dream, a dream of liberty. And this idea and this dream drove what's been called the American experiment. But our understanding of that idea is imperfect, and for many, the dream is still deferred. Too often we embrace leaders and ideas that divide us and turn our people against one another. The old, old enemies of racism, bigotry, and injustice still afflict us. For that, we ask your forgiveness and for your spirit to give us the guidance and the willingness to do better. And God, we ask you to help us to begin that great experiment in liberty once again. May we look anew at the idea of what America should be and how that applies in the time in which we live and how it must come to better include all the peoples who make up this nation. Remind us that the American dream must be for all or it's no dream at all. Teach us that freedom finds its highest expression when we offer it up for everyone's benefit. And thank you, God, for this weekend when we remember what we were meant to be and make us true to the vision of what America could become. Help us to dream dreams again. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Joe? Good morning. I'm reading from Galatians. Even though I was so excited, I wanted to do it earlier. It's chapter 5, verse 1, and then verses 13 through 25. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, 
and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters, not only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Thank you. Stories that people choose to remember and to pass on tell you a lot about who they believe they are. I have a friend who's passed away now, but we used to get together at Disciples General Assemblies. I went to college with him, and at some point he'd drag out his college yearbook and we would sit and go through the pictures and tell exactly the same stories we had told every single time and enjoyed them just as much, if not more. But when you have a family get-together, remember those where we had those? Or see old, old friends or stories start to be told. And usually they are also the same stories they told last year, but no one ever gets tired of them. Because these stories say what these friends what this family believe is important about their life together. They're saying in a way, this is who we are. And if the tales grow in the telling a little bit, and they do, that tells you quite a bit as well. If nothing else, they tell you what they wish had happened. One thing I try to do when I'm preparing for a funeral, especially if it's somebody I haven't had the chance to know well, is I like to get with the family and sit down and start to get them telling stories about their dear departed. Jenny does the same thing. And even if I can't use those stories, and frequently I can, how they tell me how that person mattered to those people, what that person meant in their lives. And that's something that I need to know, and it kind of gives me a framework for the whole sermon. Nations and peoples tell stories about themselves too. This weekend, we're taking time to remember ours. More on that in just a bit. Now, scholars believe that these stories of Genesis, which were told and passed along orally for a long, long time, weren't finally written down in a single narrative. Probably, now my scholarship is prehistoric, so it may have changed, but probably they weren't written down into a single narrative until the time of David when the kingdom of Israel was still strong and confident and it was sure it had been chosen by God for a special purpose and probably felt like they were carrying that purpose out. And at some point, it seemed good to them to write down the story of Israel's ancestors as a way of reminding people of who they were and why and how they had been called to be a nation. From their very beginnings, they had this special call. And remember, these people believed themselves to once have been known bondage and slavery, 
and now that they were a free and strong nation with a special role to play. And these stories are a way of saying we're not just ex-slaves. We have been this people from the very start of our, from our very beginnings. So this is the context for reading this great story of how Rebecca came to marry Isaac and become, become the mother of a free people called by God. And there's so much in this story that's just delightful. I have a hard time picturing Rebecca as some demure, dutiful maiden. I mean, she's walking down to the spring, well, because that's part of her responsibility, but she chooses how she's going to do it, just as she chooses to not only give this thirsty traveler a drink, but to take care of his animals as well. I picture her as confident and joyful and probably looking for adventure and the next new thing, whether it's a stranger at the well and the stories he might have to tell, or going to a far country to marry a man she's never met and build her life among a new people. And what's striking in this story, and I think it's a very important, is that no one makes Rebecca do this. We have an idea of arranged marriage where, daughter, I've set up this wonderful marriage for you, and he happens to have a lot of fields that are about ours, so uh, you're going to marry him. Here, after Abraham's servant tells his story and what his mission is, and ask, and ask if Rebecca can go with him, her family asks her if she wants to do this and is willing to do this and go off to Canaan and marry Isaac. This is not decided for her as the custom might have dictated. She makes a free choice. And she freely says yes, and that makes all the difference to this story. The stories we remember on July 4th and this holiday weekend tell who we believe ourselves to be as Americans. Now, Lord knows most of us were taught, especially those of us of a certain age, were taught the official version, which makes our ancestors look better than they were and leaves out an awful lot that was not so good. It's interesting, we watched Hamilton yesterday on Disney and it's a very interesting take on the story. Plus, a lot of people's stories have been left out though they're becoming a part of the narrative, and that's a process that's often uncomfortable, and the new version that's going to emerge is going to take a while. But in the long run, I believe it'll be good. In the long run, I believe it'll make our national story better. And if we tell more about the failings than we used to hear in third grade history, well, maybe it makes what our ancestors accomplished all the more remarkable because they weren't plaster saints, they were just human beings like us who found a way to do remarkable things. Israel, when they told the story of their ancestors, pulled no punches in describing their strengths and their faults. Wait till we get to Jacob, who had great illustrations like that. But again, all those things just made it a, a better story and more remarkable how God could use these people. But we remember Rebecca largely because she said yes to the life that was offered to her. And isn't that who we remember when we tell the story of our nation? The people who said yes to whatever challenges their time offered? None of them was perfect. Some of them are people that a lot of things about them we probably wouldn't approve of. Some who did great things may have even have been complicit in the bad things, if only by an action. But the thing that make them memorable is that they said yes to the opportunities and the challenges of the times in which they lived. That, and not some perfect school book version of them, is what we should learn from their stories. Say yes to what his history brings you. And there's no lack of opportunity to do that in our time right now, is there? Something that struck me as I worked on this, is that you and I, all of us, are in the process of adding our own stories to the story of our nation. And this is kind of a difficult chapter we're writing right now. And as people down the, the years read our chapter, what would we want them to know about us 
and how we responded to what came in our own time. Do we really want them to read the stories of people who wouldn't wear a mask or mistook freedom for the right to be irresponsible and not to care for their neighbors? Is the legacy we leave that of people who responded in fear when others wanted to make their lives a whole, whole part of this saga? Or do we want it to be a pe the story of people who said yes? I hope you're all enjoying your holiday weekend, your 4th of July. And if you haven't already, take a moment to reflect on the stories that have been passed on to us about what it means to be American and think about the story that you would like for your life to add to that greater story. Of course, that Independence Day is a festival of freedom that we celebrate in a lot of ways, and it's going to involve fireworks and bratwurst at some point, most likely. And we look back to what the origins of the story of our freedom, and we look ahead to how that story might go on. This too, at this table, is a festival of freedom. We look back and we remember what Jesus did to give us the freedom of new and abundant life. And we think about passing it on just as we pass this bread and this cup to, to others that they too may know that freedom and that new life and what it means to be a, a, a redeemed people. So as we celebrate our festival of national freedom, let us also celebrate our festival of freedom in Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here to this wonderful spot, this table today, where we are called to remember you, Jesus, and all you did for us. As we remember everything else in our world at this time, our history as a nation, Israel's history through Rebecca, we do remember you, Jesus, and we ask you to bless and honor our time together as we celebrate this meal. Amen. And we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, he blessed and broke it, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given it to me, he said, This is my blood poured out for the new covenant, for new life. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he goes. These are the gifts of God for the people. The body of Christ given for you. The cup of salvation. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for refreshing us, renewing us, and sending us forth through this gift to remind us of your body and your blood and to send us into the world bringing peace. Amen. And now unto the one who is able to keep us from falling and who lifts us from the deep, dark valley of despair to the bright mountain of hope, from the midnight of desperation to the daybreak of joy. To God be power and authority forever. Amen.
Boy, that was 